This is the seventh beer tribology webinar, and Evan Zabowski is going to present. He's a senior technical advisor at Test Oil. And um, so this, this webinar is named after Ralph Beard. Uh, a lot of you in the tribology community, community know him um, or knew of him, and he uh, helped us establish the minor at Auburn University uh, to teach uh, tribology undergraduate students. Uh, so we've been planning to do this uh, first Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. And we'll continue at least until the fall here. We're not sure about next year, uh, but we have uh, four seminars planned this fall. Um, so after Evan, uh, next month in October will be uh, John Woodhouse, and he's gonna talk about um, tribology of rosin on, on violin strings and how that affects the sound. So that should be a really good, uh, interesting talk. Uh, in November, uh, Menzu is a professor at Arkansas, and she's going to talk about uh, micro and nano uh, topography and uh, how you can control tribological applications with that. And then in December, Isabella Zufarska. Um, she's going to talk about um, chemical and microstructural evolution of contacts. And that'll wrap it up for this year. Um, any of the previous talks, they're recorded, and uh, you can go to the website here and, and watch any of those. Uh, so um, about the minor and the program here, uh, we have a minor for undergrad students, um, and there's more information on the website about that. We also have a graduate certificate, so for people in industry who are looking for a, a little more extensive background in tribology, um, there's that program that is available as well, and that's all that's taught online. So uh, almost anybody can do it. Um, this uh, webinar was also an idea that came from our industrial advisory board, uh, specifically uh, Ross Shaw, Maureen Hunter. Uh, so thank, thanks to them and everybody else on the board for uh, their input and uh, helping to guide the program forward. And also we have a number of sponsors that we uh, truly appreciate. Uh, they help uh, fund scholarships and uh, undergrad research and just the minor in general. And uh, we greatly appreciate it. If you're interested in also uh, helping uh, us out in this way, just uh, contact me and let me know. Um, yeah, so the uh, use the chat, please, for any questions, because uh, with this many people involved in the, uh, the webinar, um, it'll get kind of chaotic if we open up to uh, uh, oral questions. So if you type it in the chat, I'll be, I'll be watching that at the end and uh, we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Uh, but thank you for attending. And so I'll introduce our speaker now and then uh, I'll turn it over to Evan. So uh, Evan Zabowski is a certified lubrication specialist with diplomas in chemical engineering and fourth class power engineering. He has extensive experience training tradesmen, professionals in a variety of fields, including lubrication fundamentals, contamination control, condition monitoring, RCM, FMEA, and used oil analysis. Uh, Evan has been a member of SDLE for over 20 years, serving as a chair of the Alberta section for eight years, and also an instructor of the uh, condition monitoring course at SDLE annual meetings. Um, Evan was also the uh, editor of the TLT magazine and has also served as the other editor of the, TLT, or the SDLE Alberta section's uh, base handbook lubrication and uh, also contributed as one of the editors for STLE's uh, SCRC Handbook of Lubrication Tribology Volume 2, which is a, a great uh, book if you're looking for any some information on tribology, a good uh, handbook to have on your shelf. So uh, I, know, I know him from STLE and uh, we've kind of worked together periodically through uh, the board of directors there um, and also TLT. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Evan. <laughs> oh, thanks, Rob. Um, definitely honored to be here. And I'll preface this by saying uh, my presentation won't be uh, like peer reviewed research or anything as high level as some of the other folks, but uh, give you some background. As a as senior technical advisor at Test Oil, uh, which is a commercial uh, used lubricant analysis laboratory, uh, my job, as Rob said, is I do a lot of training. And I train people at all kinds of levels from uh, basically end users to reliability engineers, plant managers, that kind of thing. And 
I realize I have to earn some trust. I have to get people to listen to what I have to say if they're going to you know, listen to me for three days straight. And one of the best examples I can come up with is to hit them where it hurts. So I like to uh, do a poll on the very first day before we get started. You know, we go around the room, we introduce ourselves real quick. And one of the questions I ask everybody, and you can consider your own answer to this question, is do you use in your own personal applications, whatever vehicle you drive to work, you know, car, truck, doesn't matter, uh, do you use zero W lubricants? And inevitably, a good 95% or more of the audience will always say no. And of the few percent that ever do say yes, I always ask a follow-up question. I ask them why. I said, is it because the OEM said you have to, or is it a conscious choice on your part? And inevitably, most people who ever answer yes will, will say, yeah, we just do it because it's, it's the OEM requirement. And so I, I you know, learned over the years that this answer rarely changes, and most people will not consciously decide to use zero W. So I'm giving away the end of the presentation right now, but I'm always planting this like a seed to try and get you to listen to everything else I have to say. So what I've done is I've cherry picked the slides that pertain to that uh, from a very long course. So bear with me, it's gonna go kind of fast in some parts, but I'm gonna try and explain in a way that, you know, many of us probably know a lot of this information, but did we actually apply it in our everyday lives in a way that impacts us, which is why we came up with the title of improving fuel efficiency, because that usually catches people's interest. Uh, so with that thought in mind, let me get started here. So um, I always start with some lubrication fundamentals. And at the beginning of any section, I always cover any definitions for terms that people might not necessarily know. So this is going to be an easy one, hopefully for most of the crowd. Uh, what is viscosity, right? It's just basically three words, resistance to flow. And most of us understand resistance to flow or can kind of conceptualize it. But I like to take it a step further. And I would say there's, there's four very fundamental things about viscosity that you need to know in terms of what can change it. Now, two of them directly relate to temperature, right? And most of us know higher temperature, lower viscosity, that's a given. What a lot of people that I encounter don't necessarily understand is that that change is not linear. Meaning that if I take, take an oil and heat it up 10 degrees, everyone will appreciate it will thin. But if I heat it up another 10 degrees, it may not necessarily thin by the same amount again. So that's what I mean by it's not linear. It's not a direct relationship in that regard. But the other thing that I always mention is that no two oils are necessarily the same rate of change. Meaning I can take two oils at the same temperature and they have the same viscosity, heat them both up 10 degrees, and one of them may thin more than the other one. So to help people understand this concept, I always pull up a piece of what I call uh, special paper. Uh, this is just a log by log viscosity temperature paper. It's from ASTM D341. And this is just special graph paper that allows you to plot what would normally be a curved line and make it appear straight. And this allows us to make a, a predictive analysis of viscosity. So just to show you kind of how this works, give you an everyday example. Imagine there's a hydraulic system we're using a 32 uh, oil, so ISO viscosity grade 32. And the question is, what is the viscosity of that oil at an operating temperature of approximately 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Celsius? Now, if you go to a product data sheet and look up the viscosities for the oil, you're gonna see the viscosity is listed at 40 and 100 degrees Celsius. It's not listed at 70. So you can't find the answer real quick. Now, temptation would say, you might realize that 70 degrees Celsius is exactly halfway between 40 and 100. So you're gonna think, well, why wouldn't the viscosity be exactly halfway between whatever it is at 40 compared to whatever it is at 100? Well, do the math on that real quick. You look at the product data sheet in this example here, you can see the viscosity is 32 at 40 degrees Celsius, five and a half at 100 degrees Celsius. Take 32, add five and a half, you get 37 and a half, divide by two, you're left with 18 and three quarters. That's the number that's exactly halfway between the two. So let's just round that to 19 here real quick. If we assumed viscosity had a linear relationship with temperature, we would think then, and this is, we know this is wrong, but we would think that the viscosity should be for this oil at that temperature, 19 centistokes. Now, if we pull up a sheet of special paper, we can figure out what the real answer is. So what we do is we take those two data points that you would find on a product data sheet and you just simply plot them. So at 40 degrees Celsius, 
you find 32 centistokes and you put yourself a little dot. Then at 100 degrees Celsius, you find five and a half centistokes and you put a second dot. Now all that's left is draw a straight line between those two dots. From this line, we can now predict the viscosity at other temperatures. We can both interpolate and extrapolate data if we'd like to. In this case, we only have to interpolate, so here we go. From 70 degrees Celsius, we come up until we find the line. And then at that point of intersection, we cross over and we can read the answer off the right-hand axis. Turns out the viscosity of that product at that temperature is closer to about 11, 11 and a half than it is 19. So I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate how different viscosity is from the supposed or predictive path that a lot of people might think it would follow. But another example I quickly then move to is I asked people, I said, okay, imagine you have a gearbox. Imagine it's running hot. Imagine there's nothing else wrong with the gearbox. There's no noise, there's no vibration. The oil's at the right level. Everything looks like it's running properly. I said, but is running hot. I said, what would you do? And for those that are involved with you know, lubricants, one of the best answers they can come up with is generally speaking, decrease the viscosity of the lubricant. Because if it's running hot, but there's no wear metals, there's no noise, there's no vibration. It's not from too thin of a lubricant layer, it's probably from too thick of a lubricant layer, and that's causing some fluid friction. So the short answer is, let's switch to a thinner lubricant. So then I asked people, I said, okay, well, imagine we go to your lube room at the whatever plant this is at, and the only two oils you have suitable for a gearbox are an ISO viscosity grade 220 and an ISO viscosity grade 320. I said, which of the two will you use? And of course, you know, knee-jerk answer is, well, we already know it should be the thinner of the two products, so they decide that the answer must be 220. It would be the thinner or the lower grade. So then what I do is I show them this plot. Now this is done in Excel. So Excel allows me the logarithmic scale on the left-hand axis, but I can't do the double log scale uh, easily uh, with this. So there is curvature to this line, but that's good because it reminds me change is not linear. But let's look at the graph. Right? You can see at room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, yes, your 320 is definitively thicker than your 220. It'd be kind of like comparing, say, liquid honey with pancake syrup. You could tell which one's thicker, but they'd both be rather viscous. The point is, though, is if you take these two uh, oils up to operating temperatures, say, roughly, again, 70 degrees Celsius, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, what do you notice about the two oils? Well, as you can see by the two lines here, they converge. They are, in fact, the same viscosity or very, very similar viscosity at that temperature. So if this was, in fact, a hot gearbox, it probably wouldn't be running at 70 degrees Celsius or 160 degrees Fahrenheit. It'd be significantly higher. And if it was, say, closer to 200 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly 100 degrees Celsius, which of those two oils is actually the thinner oil? And this is where, you know, the, the minds start to get blown, right? People go, wow, didn't know that. Now, in all honesty and fairness, uh, this is a particular 320 compared with a particular 220. Uh, this is by no means what every 220 and every 320 look like compared to each other. But my big point is when people ask questions about viscosity, said so you should always, always, always also ask at what temperature, right? Make sure you follow up with that question because you can't presume that one oil being thicker or thinner than another will remain that way through an entire uh, temperature range that you might expect to operate at that. So with those two fundamental things out of the way, what's the third fundamental thing? Well, that's pressure. When it comes to pressure, pressure works in the opposite direction as temperature, right? An increase in temperature causes a decrease in viscosity, but an increase in pressure causes an increase in viscosity. And I give you a few facts and figures here that at roughly 30,000 PSI, you'd expect about a five-fold, give or take, uh, increase on viscosity. And one of the best examples I give of that is, is Hoover Dam. If you ever get a chance to visit Hoover Dam, uh, they'll take you down inside and they'll show you where the generators are. And if you're talking to the docents, you know, you can ask them any question you like. And, uh, you know, often they get questions like how many people died during construction and stuff like that. Nobody asks about the, the maintenance. But if you do ask about the maintenance, they'll start telling you how impressive it is that though the dam's nearly 90 years old, the original set of bearings ran for over 50 years. And when you start looking at the scope of that, you realize that you're talking about a 700 ton generator vertically mounted, spinning at about 180 RPM continuously for 50 years, and the bearings never needed to be replaced. 
And then you ask them what kind of lubricant they use. And what they'll tell you is it's practically a water thin lubricant. And you go, how can a water thin lubricant lift and separate, you know, support a load of 700 tons continuously for 50 years? Because the only reason they replaced the bearings was not because they wore out, right? If they don't touch, if the bearings completely supported, you can't get the wear. What you will get is fatigue. So they replaced the bearings because they thought they were reaching a fatigue point. You go, okay, fair enough. You, but still, you go, it's water thin. How can it do it? Well, because of pressure. Pressure squeezes the oil and pressure causes the viscosity to increase. But then you take that into consideration for a second. You go, but wait a minute. If I squeeze oil, sure, you know, viscosity will increase. But what about the temperature? Temperature is going to go up. So if the temperature goes up, the viscosity should come down. So what's the net result? Well, the easy way I always say to remember it is pressure always wins. So the net result of a pressure increase may cause a temperature increase, which may decrease the viscosity, but the net result is the increase due to pressure will outpace the decrease due to uh, temperature and pressure will always win. So the net result is the viscosity will increase. And you can see over on the right, some other statistics about how much of an increase you may or may not expect. But when you get to the point of elastohydrodynamic lubrication, when you have a very small contact area and a very high pressure, you can get millions of fold increase on viscosity. And that helps people understand why does the metal move out of the lubricant's way with EHL lubrication versus you know, the lubricant just simply being squeezed out and the metals coming in contact with each other, you know, potentially welding or, or any other wear mechanism. So we start to appreciate that there's a lot more to viscosity than maybe we always think of for the average application. But we have one more fundamental consideration that I like to throw in to make us understand completely why do we choose the lubricants we do for some of the applications. And that fourth function, that fourth fundamental change that can occur to viscosity is caused by something called shear. Now give this a consideration. Uh, imagine you have an open cup of oil. So it's, it's open to the atmosphere. There's no pressure on this. You, you stick a paddle inside that open cup of oil and all you do is stir it. The question is, what do you think happens to viscosity if that's all you're doing? Does the viscosity follow curve number one, stays exactly the same, there's no change in viscosity? Does it follow curve number two, it actually decreases in viscosity? Or does it follow curve number three, it increases in viscosity? And when I'm talking to the average end user, I, I get all three answers. Some people swear it won't change, some people swear it will change, and then they disagree which direction they think it will change. But I always make sure that they don't think the change is due to temperature or pressure. Right? It's open to the atmosphere, there is no pressure, and we're not stirring it fast enough to impart any energy to cause a temperature change. We're just simply stirring the oil. So the nice thing about this question is there's no wrong answer. If you thought it was curve number one, if you thought there was no change to the viscosity just because you stirred it, you must have been thinking it was a Newtonian fluid, because that is how Newtonian fluids behave. Now, of course, if you're not familiar with the term Newtonian, you might ask, what is that? And in everyday language, Newtonian fluids are what we would call monograds, straight grades, single grades, oils that in their product name typically only have one number in them, because that's just the single grade that they are. These oils are typically Newtonian, meaning no matter how long we sat there stirring, without a change in temperature, without a change in pressure, the viscosity will not change. Now, for those that were convinced that there must be a change, then you have to be thinking of a non-Newtonian fluid, because in that case, the viscosity could change. So what happens is we have two different ways it can go. Curve number two is, yes, it will decrease due to the stirring, and that is what you call a fixotropic fluid. And the best everyday example I can give you of fixotropic behavior, of a shear thinning behavior, is ketchup. Because think about this, you got ketchup, it's in a bottle, it's thick, right? It doesn't flow very well. You, you tip the bottle and you try and get it to pour and it won't pour. It's very, very thick, it's, it's got good viscosity. So how do you get ketchup out of a bottle? Well, of course, everyone's got their techniques. You know, some people do the, the hit it on the bottom. Um, my grandfather though, he, uh, he loved ketchup. And his technique was to take the bottle, hold it on an angle and he'd take a knife and he'd insert the knife into the bottle and pull the knife out. And when he did that, a lot of ketchup would come out. But the second the knife cleared the, the top of the bottle, the flow would stop. Now, as a kid, I always wondered, you know, why was this? How did it work? You know, why was this trick always a good trick? And you start to think, you know, you can't get liquid out of a container if you don't let air back in. 
So in my mind, I thought all he was doing was basically burping the bottle and letting some air in by breaking the seal of the fluid against the neck of the bottle. In reality, though, he was in the most literal sense of the word. He was shearing the ketchup. He was cutting the ketchup. By imparting that mechanical energy of sliding the knife through the ketchup, the viscosity of the ketchup decreases to the point that it actually flows. So as he's pulling the knife out, you get lower viscosity and it will flow out of the neck of the bottle. Now, when I try and do my research to you know, figure these things out and come up with creative ways of explaining them to people, you know, I obviously am going to go to the experts here on ketchup. So I went to Heinz's website one year and I started looking up information about ketchup. And this is a rabbit hole you can go down if you'd so like, but question number one in their frequently asked question section is how do you get ketchup out of a Heinz bottle? And their answer is that you take the bottle, you hold it at an angle, and then with one or two fingers, you repeatedly tap it quickly on the sweet spot of the bottle, and it says ketchup will flow. Now they don't explain that you tapping repeatedly and quickly will cause mechanical energy to go in from vibration, but they assure you it works. Now question number two on the FAQs is where's the sweet spot on the bottle? And the answer is where the Heinz 57 logo is located. And question number three is how many people know this? So whatever survey Heinz did at whatever time suggested that about 11% of the US population knows this is the trick for how to get ketchup out of a bottle. So if you don't have any other takeaways from my presentation so far, there you go, you got one, how to get ketchup out of a bottle. But it's because ketchup is a pseudoplastic thixotropic fluid. It has sheer thinning capabilities. And in everyday language, the kind of non-Newtonian fluids that we consider to be thixotropic are what you'd call a multigrade, or typically oils that have two numbers in their names, right? Two different numbers, like 5W30 or 10W30 would be classics that a lot of people have heard of. However, as I said, there were no wrong answers to the original question, which curve did it follow? So looking at this curve number three, are there any fluids that follow curve number three? Certainly. Those fluids are what we know as rheopectic fluids. Rheopectic fluids are sheer thickening fluids. So while ketchup is thixotropic and is a time-dependent shear thinning application, this is a shear stress-dependent uh, application where the greater the shear, the more the viscosity will change. And an everyday example I can give you of this is silly putty. Think about silly putty. If you take a ball of silly putty, roll it into a nice little ball, and then drop it from a short height onto your desk, what happens? Right. Nothing, right? Basically hits and that's about it. If you did the same thing with Play-Doh, you wouldn't see any difference between those two products. But what if you left those balls sitting on your desk for about three days, right? You'd come back three days later and that Play-Doh would be dried out. It'd still be in the ball shape though. You come back to the Silly Putty three days later, it's gonna look like a puddle. It clearly has flow characteristics. So now you take those two, you roll them back into the little balls. Now drop them from a greater height. What happens? Well, the Play-Doh still doesn't do much of anything, but the Silly Putty will actually bounce if you drop it say from shoulder height all the way to the floor. What happens if you throw it really hard? Well, if you throw a Play-Doh really hard at the floor, again, not much happens. It pretty much hits the floor and that's it. But that silly putty will bounce like a super ball. The harder you hit it, the more it wants to bounce back. And here's a really fun experiment you can try. Take a ball of silly putty, you know, roll it up into a nice little ball, put it on a surface you don't mind damaging. So I'm not saying you're going to damage the surface. I'm saying don't do this on the dining room table. But once that ball is placed on a hard surface, go get a hammer, like biggest one you can find, three pounds, mini sledge, whatever you got. Hit that ball as hard as you can. Imagine it's a three inch nail and you're gonna drive it in with one strike. What do you think happens? Well, no, it's not that the hammer bounces back all of a sudden because it's like pounding on a super ball. No, the crazy thing is it'll shatter. You will hit that silly putty so hard, it will take on so much energy and being that it thickens due to sheer stress, it will take on a solid form. It'll actually fracture like a solid. It'll shatter like glass. And the cool thing is you can pick up all those pieces and you can roll them back into a ball and repeat the experiment endlessly. It's a really cool feature of rheopectic fluids. Another good example, if, you're, if you have kids, grandkids, whatever it might be, make them a batch of oobleck. Oobleck is what we call a 50-50 mixture of cornstarch and water. And there's plenty of physics videos on YouTube showing people making up batches of oobleck. And the cool thing is that you can pick it up with your fingers and it's like running your fingers through oatmeal. Right? It's kind of runny, a little bit thick, but it doesn't really stick to anything um, like oatmeal. It does run off uh, a little bit cleaner than that. But 
If you take that same bowl that you can try and pick it up with your fingers and it just runs like liquid, now punch it. Punch the surface of that liquid, it's like hitting the table. It's really cool stuff, but it is also a real peptic fluid. So two different examples, just to give you an idea as to how this behavior can be observed. And you go, okay, in the practical sense of the lubricants world, where in the world would we use this? Well, like I always like to mention, you know, if you're ever shopping for a vehicle, there's such a thing as a four-wheel drive vehicle and there's such a thing as an all-wheel drive vehicle. And if you're like me, you might think, well, gee, there's four wheels on all vehicles. So isn't four-wheel drive the same as all-wheel drive? Well, the short answer is the industry convention, not saying everybody follows this, but industry convention more or less dictates if the vehicle is marketed as four-wheel drive, it's because somehow inside the cabin of the vehicle, there is a way to select two versus four. You know, it could be a shifter, a button, a knob, whatever it is, but basically the driver is in control of the decision between two and four. When it's marketed as all-wheel drive, industry convention generally dictates that the vehicle gets to decide whether or not it's two or four. So when you ask the average person on the street, how do you think it does this? What do you think is the decision-making you know, logic tree to two versus four? Most people are imagining the hardware behind that decision is something like the sophisticated ABS braking system. And there's gotta be speed sensors on the wheels and all kinds of stuff happening. And the short answer is it's Ublek. Basically between the front wheels and the rear wheels, they put a viscous coupling. So the coupling is filled with this you know, real pectic type fluid. And if one half of the coupling turns faster or slower than the other half of the coupling, then there's shear stress on that fluid. And then the coupling, rather than allowing that difference in speed between the two halves, engages and it locks it up. And that's how energy transfers from whichever set's going faster to the other set that's going slower. So viscous coupling fluids are a lubricant that you will see on your average passenger vehicle if it's an all wheel drive type vehicle. So like I said, short answer is all three answers were on the table. Now, going through all this information, why do I mention it? It's because going back to curve number two, going back to what we called multigrades, why do we care? Why do we care if it shear thins? Well, taking a look at this graphic here, you've got a blue line and an orange line. The blue line is new oil, the orange line is used oil. Let's look at the blue line first. Basically, the blue line is representing the trip oil takes through an engine in one cycle. So the oil starts in the bottom of the crankcase. As you turn the key to start your vehicle, obviously the pump starts turning and your pump will pick up the oil through the oil pickup screen. As it goes through the screen, that's shear energy, it will thin. As it goes through the pump, that's more shear energy, it will thin. It gets pushed through the filter, more shear energy, more thinning, all the way to the top through the cam towers, past the valves, the ring cylinder, past the bearings, everything, all one trip you will see the viscosity continue to drop and drop and drop the more shear we put across that oil. So as you follow this graph from left to right, you will see that yes, the viscosity will drop. That drop is something we refer to as temporary shear. This is desirable. This aids with cold starts in particular, All right? If you stick the key in the ignition, you try and start the vehicle and goes rrr, rrr, and it doesn't start. Now you try the second time and it works. Well, why does it work the second time when it didn't work the first time? Well, some of that reason, certainly not all of that reason, but some of that reason is that you've put the oil in motion, which means that some of the oil is thinner, causing less resistance and therefore lower friction, easier starting. But this also means that during that start, while you're getting that initial oil flow, the viscosity will thin and it will flow faster to the places it needs to flow. And this is where the real benefit comes in that we get decreased viscosity without having to wait for the increase in temperature. Now, as I said, the orange line on here is used oil and you'll notice it's a little bit lower than the blue line. So used oil typically has a lower viscosity than new oil. And that's because of something that we call permanent shear, a permanent drop to the viscosity. So this is unrecoverable viscosity and this is not necessarily a good thing. We can tolerate a little bit of this, but I'm, again, just planting a seed here for later, we don't wanna see a whole lot of this. This could cause us problems. So that being said, now that you've covered the four fundamental ways that viscosity may change due to outside factors, let's return to that example. If I come back to this example that we had at the beginning of hydraulic fluid and asked you what was the viscosity of the fluid at 70 degrees Celsius, now let me ask you a new question. From an end user perspective, this would be a common question. They go, would this oil be suitable if we operate this hydraulic system between say um, 32 
and 70 degrees Celsius, so roughly about 90 to 160 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So the way to answer that question is to return to our piece of special paper that we drew the line on, but we're going to add a few more lines to it. And those additional lines are going to come from some lookup tables. So these are typically found in many oil companies' product data guides. I flip to the back and you'll see this, these tables commonly reproduced. But basically, this first one is maximum viscosity at startup. So what is the highest viscosity any type of system should have during a cold start? And if you find hydraulic on this list, you'll notice it's way down at the bottom and it suggests 54 centistokes. So just remember that number for a few seconds here, 54 centistokes. We go to the next couple of lookup tables and we see that the minimum um, viscosity, so at operating temperatures for a hydraulic system, you see that one in the middle there is about 13 centistokes. And the optimum viscosity for hydraulic systems at the top of that chart, and it suggests 25 centistokes. So holding those numbers in your mind here for a second, 54, 13, and 25, we return to that original piece of special paper. Now, the question was, would that oil be suitable all the way down to 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, up to uh, 70 degrees Celsius, or about 160 Fahrenheit? So right away, you can see our line does not go back far enough to a cold enough temperature. So we'll have to extrapolate that. So we extrapolate that line, stretch it out, and we've got it going to 32. Now we add in those other three lines for targets. So the thou shalt not cross, 54 centistoke line, don't go any higher than this. 13 centistokes, don't go any lower than this. And 25, try and hit this one as best you can. The question was, would this oil work between 32 and 70 degrees Celsius? Whoops, there we go. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. There. Um, well, what we see is if I get that other line in here, come on, come back, there we go. If you look at the blue line, our original oil, it goes what I consider, you know, how I say it here, let me bring up my laser pointer, it goes outside of the box right here. It gets too thin. It has too low a viscosity for the entire temperature range, so it's outside of the box. So what do we consider? Well, natural reaction is, well, if it's too thin, we should go to a thicker oil. So we go one grade up to the next higher viscosity, which is a 46, and this one happens to go outside of the box just about here. So we don't have a perfect solution. We don't have an oil that stays within the recommended range for a hydraulic system from cold start to normal operating temperatures for the entire temperature range that was specified. So typically where we look is we start looking at some other fluids. Now, as an example, what if we look up a synthetic? So if we look up a synthetic, we would find, here we go, that the slope of that line changes. And because the slope changes, that line stays what I would say is inside the box. It is not too thick at the cold temperatures and it's not too thin at the high temperatures. This oil stays within the range as we need it. So to explain the slope of this line on the special paper is one more property we need to be aware of. And you know, the axiom in industry is the most important property of a lubricant is viscosity. And if you ask somebody what are the three most important properties of a lubricant, they'll always say viscosity, viscosity, viscosity. Well, it doesn't really help you because you, you know you want to know what to look at afterwards. So what do we look at after viscosity? Well, it's not that different. Uh, we tend to go to viscosity index. So what is viscosity index? Well, it's this absolutely arbitrary unitless number that refers to how much an oil will change in viscosity due to temperature. And so basically a high VI oil has a shallow slope and a low VI oil has a steeper slope. Well, you go, okay, fair enough, but you know, I might need more of an explanation. Well, to answer that, think of it this way. When the scale was created, it was created uh, in 1928. And uh, the way they came up with this is they basically looked at the two oils that they had out there that were at the extremes. The oil that had the least amount of change compared to the oil with the most amount of change. So it was basically California and Gulf Coast oils that changed the most due to temperature and they arbitrarily called those ones zero. Then they took the oil that changed the least with temperature, which happened to be a Pennsylvania crude and called it 100. And so it was a reference scale for the first few years, it kind of worked, but then obviously people find new uh, sources of oil, different ways of refining and the references kind of were shifting around. So they standardized this and said, forget it. We're gonna make it a calculation. So they turned it into a math calculation uh, as a way of referencing the VI now. And it is a number still unitless and it's referring to this original scale. But what you'll see now is there are lots of oils that have VIs higher than 100. 
That being said, how do we get it a lot higher? Well, now we need to just break into uh, another section here real quick. We need to discuss additives. So one of the key things I always mention about additives is that different oils have different amounts of additives. What makes one oil different from another oil isn't necessarily what additives it has, but sometimes how much of those additives it may have. And as you can see on the extremes of this, that engine oils uh, typically have the most additive concentration compared to uh, things like turbine and RNO fluids, which have the lowest amount of additives. But when you look at the far left here and you do see engine oils, and you'll see that they do have a you know, reasonable slug of additives in there, you'll also notice they've got an additive specifically to change the VI. We call this viscosity index improver for those of you who haven't uh, really dealt with this before. So you go, what is a VI improver as we call it for short? Well, VI improver is this. It's an oil additive that is meant to change the rate at which oil changes viscosity with temperature. So it doesn't cause it to be any thinner when it's cold, but what it does do is restrict how much it will thin as it heats up. Now, if you wanna know the basic mechanism for how it works, it's essentially a long chain polymer is the most common type we use, and it unfurls at higher temperatures. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you first say it out loud. So you go, okay, picture it differently. Picture it visually, think of it like an octopus. If an octopus is swimming in cold water, what does it look like, right? It's got little tentacles all pulled in, it's cold, right? But you put that octopus in hot water, what does it look like, right? It gets into a warm current of water, it's gonna fan out its tentacles and go, whew, man, is it hot in here? That's kind of what that additive is like. So then imagine if we put millions of microscopic octopi in your oil, and when they're cold, they're tiny. They have no effect on viscosity. But as the oil heats up, the oil will want to thin but these will start unfurling their tentacles. And if they have millions of, mil, millions of microscopic octopi with their tentacles out in all directions, what do you think they're gonna to do to the flow of the oil? You might describe those octopi as resistant to flow, right? viscosity. So that's what we're doing. Now, the interesting thing is when I ask the average person who I get in my classes, you know, how do you think we make 1030 motor oil? A lot of people will say, well, you take some 10, you take some 30, you add a 50-50 mixture, 1030. You're like, no. That's how we get 20s, actually. Uh, they try and guess again, and more times than not, most people believe 1030 motor oils are 30 weight base oils made to behave like 10s when they're cold. And it's actually the complete opposite. It's this additive that makes multigrades. So what we do is we actually start with a lower viscosity base oil. So 1030, as an example, starts with a 10W base oil, and we additize it with millions of microscopic octopi or VI improvers, so that when it heats up, it doesn't thin as much as a 10W would want to normally thin. And what you'll find is at the higher temperatures, it starts to approach the viscosity of a 30 weight. And that's how you get the multigrade. Now, if you're curious, obviously it's, it's not really octopus, you know, but uh, it is a polymethacrylate. And the issue is that this long chain polymer, if you think about it for a second, you go, what happens if you take that long chain polymer and put it through a really tight clearance? Right? You know, if you had a microscopic octopi and pushed it through a really tight clearance, it, it, it might fold its little tentacles back, but then they'd pop back out. That'd be a, a, a pretty temporary effect, right? But if it's a tight enough clearance, hard enough mechanical energy to it, what happens if, if one of its tentacles is removed? What, what's another word for this, right? It's not cut, it's not removed, it's not amputate. The word I'm fishing for here is shear. If you shear off those arms of the octopus and turn it into calamari, it's not really going to have any effect on the viscosity anymore. And so this long chain polymer can be mechanically sheared. And that's where we you know, refer to this as a shear effect. And that's the difference between temporary shear, meaning we fold the, the polymer back and squeeze it into a slightly smaller shape temporarily and it springs back out on its own, versus permanent shear is no, we actually break the polymer down we chop it into little pieces and therefore it doesn't have the effect that it has anymore. So having absorbed everything I've said so far, you're going, okay, fair enough. This presentation was supposed to be about improving fuel efficiency by selecting the right oil. So let's get to that. So how does one select the right oil for a vehicle? Well, long story short, when you're picking a lubricant for a passenger vehicle, one of the things you're gonna be looking for is the API donut. And I don't have time to get into the whole donut here, but basically you've probably seen this format before. Top half refers to service categories. Bottom half may or may not refer to resource conserving, but smack in the middle of that donut says something about the SAE viscosity. And you go, SAE viscosity, 
how did they come up with those numbers? What do they mean? So that's where we need to take this presentation now. And this is where I don't think I'm gonna convince you what oil you should use. I think you'll convince yourselves. Armed with as much knowledge as we have so far, you should probably come to the right conclusion on your own. So bear with me. If I separate this chart right at that uh, laser pointer there on the left, top half and bottom half, you'll notice the top half of the oil grades are in multiples of five and they have a suffix of a W. And the bottom half of the chart, you'll notice that by and large, they're in multiples of 10. There are three exceptions, uh, but they do not have that suffix of a W. Let's talk about the bottom half first real quick. So if we take a common grade, like I'm gonna go with this row right here, I'm gonna go with the 30 weight, and we scroll on over till we see some data over here. What is this data? What is 9.3 and 12.5? Well, what you're going to see is that, of course, up here, it mentions those are viscosities. They are measured in centistokes, and they are measured at 100 degrees Celsius. Now, in their infinite wisdom, you might ask, why did SAE choose to set limits at 100 degrees Celsius? Well, it's because it represents operating temperatures. At right? 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit is very close to the bulk circulating oil temperature of a standard you know, gasoline engine. So knowing that a 30 weight is an oil that's defined right here as an oil having a viscosity between 9.3 and 12.5 Centistokes at 100 degrees Celsius, that qualifies it as being called a 30. Now that could be a 1030, a 530, a 030, a monograde 30. Doesn't matter. 30 is a 30 is a 30 is a 30. Saying all this, you go, okay, well, what is the difference between, say, a 5W30 and a 10W30? Well, for that answer, now we need to look at the top half of the chart. Now, in the top half of the chart, we're going to look at 5 and 10W. And the easiest explanation I have for simplifying this is that when I describe the differences between these two, I point out that we're measuring the pumping viscosity and the cranking viscosity for these lubricants at really, really cold temperatures. Right? Degrees Celsius, any temperature that is negative is below the freezing point, and all of these are negative. So these are all very, very cold temperatures. Now, when we qualify what the viscosity is at those temperatures. Here's just the basic way I'm going to, you know, simplify and keep it keep it easy. Is that you notice that all the pumping viscosities are identical? They're all sixty thousand centipoise. The cranking viscosities do get lower as you get colder, which is, of course is the opposite to what most of us think of. But these are targets for how the oil has to behave. Not that one oil hits all of these targets, right? But the point is that. When people ask me, what is the difference between a 5W30 and a 10W30 is, I say, well, look, the operating temperature is a 30 is a 30. So your engine doesn't really know the difference between those two products at that temperature. Where it does see the difference, though, is in the colder temperatures. So the easy way I phrase it is a 5W can do whatever a 10W can do as well or better, but five degrees colder. And I say as well because the difference between a 5W and a 10W for pumping viscosity is the same. So it does it as well, but as you can see here, minus 35 compared to minus 30, it does it five degrees colder. So I say as well or better, because when you look at the cranking viscosity, it gets a better or lower viscosity and five degrees colder. Now for the, those who like trivia that don't already know this, the W suffix is because of this cold temperature testing, the W stands for winter. Right, we're replicating winter-like conditions. So a five winter 30 weight compared to a 10 winter 30 weight, if you will, that's the difference, is that the 5W handles colder temperatures as well or better while still maintaining the 30 weight characteristics that it needs at bulk operating temperatures. So saying all that, now you know how the scale's created, you might understand grading a little bit better, you go, but the seed I planted at the very beginning said I was going to try and sell you on the concept of zero Ws. And I know people try and people fail at this all the time. And I think the best way I can show you failure of trying to convince you to do this is to show you a very common graphic that a lot of people use is this one. This is a picture of essentially the pour point test. It's done um, in a cold, cold, cold room. So this picture was taken at minus 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, for those who don't know how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit real quick, uh, minus 40 is minus 40. It's the one time the two systems agree with each other. So this is pretty darn cold. Starting on the far right, if you look, you got a 1540. That is a very common diesel engine oil. And you're noticing that it's not flowing. It's basically sticking its tongue out at you. 
Now, if you move to the left, you'll see a 1040. So what's the difference between a 1540 and a 1040? Well, 40 is a 40, but the 10W can flow as well or better, but 10 degrees colder. And what do you notice? It is flowing better, just still not really flowing. But if you compare the middle picture now, 1030 to a 1040, well, 30 is thinner than a 40, 10, 10W, but the overall benefit is it actually is flowing. You actually get oil out of that beaker into the other beaker. Now, if you keep moving to the left, you'll see the 530 flows even better than the 1030. And of course, the 030 flows best of all. And for some people, they think, there you go, argument done, I've settled, you now know why you should use zero Ws. And I'm pretty sure that most people who think that are failing at making the sale. Because here's my point, not everyone drives when it's minus 35. Not everyone even lives in a place where it gets to minus 35. So this becomes a weak argument to have if people park in an insulated garage and don't have to go through a cold start um, you know, that frequently or don't even live in an area, like I said, that can get that cold. So I don't think this is a good argument to have, but here's how I think I can win the argument. Let me pull product data information. So going to a popular brand, common, found on the shelves everywhere, brand of oil. Um, let's look at the 103530 and 030 uh, viscosities at both 40 and 100 degrees Celsius. And if you look at this chart and you look over here at the right-hand column first, what are you noticing? Well, if you're keeping up with everything I'm saying, I'm hoping that you notice that those three viscosities are between 9.3 and 12.5 centistokes, which would mean that they're all 30 weight oils. Well, that's a given, they were all graded 30, so we're just confirming that. But the second thing that you're probably noticing, this is the non-intuitive part of it, is that the zero is actually the thicker of the three products. So you're going, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. You're thinking, I, I, I got this backwards somehow, I didn't. Then you look at the next column, the middle column here, and you see the same pattern emerging. You go, that doesn't make any sense. Why is the zero thicker than the other two? Well, the answer comes a little bit more obvious if we go back to, you know, essentially special paper, I'm just gonna use Excel and plot it. So there's your three oils. And like I said, in the sake of the picture I showed you before, how most people think they can, they can win this argument is showing you somewhere over here and saying, look, your 030 and your 530 flow so much better than your 1030, this is why you should switch. And you go, fair enough, for a cold start, maybe. And again, only if it gets to really, really cold temperatures. But by the time you start approaching more normal operating temperatures, as I already said, your engine doesn't know the difference between those two fluids. A 30 is a 30. So it seems like a pretty weak argument in my mind. Anyways, I don't know if you agree, but I think it's a pretty weak argument. So here's the four questions I ask people, and this is how they can answer it themselves. This is how they can figure it out if it really works or not. I go, okay, question number one. So where, um, where does most of the friction in an engine come from? All right, and you give that some thought here. And what you're gonna conclude, and I can show you a graphic here, is that when you consider the fuel energy going into an, an engine, there's a lot of losses along the way, right? We've bent about a third of it out to atmosphere through the exhaust and there's other losses along the way. But when you get to the actual mechanical side of it, most of the friction is gonna come from the engine part of the drivetrain than anywhere else. So I'm looking specifically where in the engine would most of the friction come from? It's not the bearings, not the valves, it's the ring cylinder interface. That's where you're gonna see a pretty significant amount of uh, frictional losses. And one of the key reasons is simply surface area, right? If you look at your average, um, you know, bearings, you're going to say they're an inch wide, four inches uh, diameter. That's about four square inches, roughly speaking. You've got two, four, maybe eight of them, depending on how many shafts you've got, cams and versus the main crank, whatever. I'm saying that you've got, I don't know, 16 square inches, typically of surface area and a small engine. Not a lot of surface area that we're worrying about, and it's got a hydrodynamic film separating them, lowering the friction significantly. Why isn't your valves? Your valves, and, and be very generous here and say they're one square inch of contact area, um, and you might have four valves per cylinder, eight cylinders, you got 32 valves, you got twice the surface area. Again, being very generous with my math here, it's intermittent contact, and it usually hits uh, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication films. So, again, it's not the answer. But your piston ring interface, if you take a small, you know, 350 V8 engine, take the bore, multiply by pi to get the circumference, multiply by the stroke, get the area inside a cylinder just from the stroke, multiply that by eight, you're going to get around 600 square inches. There's a lot more surface area that we're having to support and we can't achieve 
hydrodynamic or elastohydrodynamic films throughout the entire stroke, right? Because the piston has to stop, turn around, come back repeatedly. So we've got boundary lubrication, we've got mixed lubrication, we've got contamination in there, we've got temperature throwing everything off. It's, it's one of the hardest places to really lubricate well. So knowing that that's where a lot of our friction comes from, looking at this chart here, what if you could get out of this section here of the engine, what if you could get a percent or two of that back, right? When you look at the overall energy you got out of the fuel to get that car in motion, if you could get a couple percent out of the engine, like reduce that friction by just 2%. That's almost a 10% increase in the amount of power to the wheels. You know, playing with the math here a little bit. But long story short, what if, right? What if we could reduce that friction, right? That is more energy from the fuel. That's all about fuel efficiency. So question number one is where's most of the friction come from? Question number two is this. If it's the piston ring interface, what's the temperature? Higher, lower, or the same as the bulk oil? Most people were pretty quick to say higher. Sure, it is higher. Next question is, if we know that most of our friction comes from the piston ring interface, we know the temperature is higher. Well, what of the three oils, 1030, 530, or 030, is the best oil to lubricate at those temperatures in that area? So to answer that question, I take the previous graph I showed you, just extend the plot so you can see the viscosities at higher temperatures, and lo and behold, what do you discover? Right? If you look and, you know, just giving you some average ring cylinder temperatures here, they're gonna average at least 160 degrees Celsius. So we're talking somewhere about here or even further to the right on the graph, but we don't need to get into the semantics about exact temperatures. Long story short is which of those three oils is the thickest oil providing with the most fluid film, decreasing the friction, increasing the sealing, transferring as much of the power, giving you the fuel efficiency, whatever, whatever positive things you wanna say about lubrication and its effect on the overall performance of the engine. Well, you're gonna look at that and go, huh, this is 0, 030 compared to the five compared to the 10. So last, fourth, final question I always ask people is said, can we agree? And this is just agree or disagree question. Can we agree whether we live in the upper peninsula in Minnesota and it's January, it's the coldest month of the year, or we live in Death Valley in July, it's the hottest month of the year. Can we agree that our engine will do everything in its power to operate at the same overall temperature, regardless of ambient conditions? And again, you know, barring a few degrees either way, yeah, it does, it really tries to. So long story short, it actually doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what the ambient condi conditions are. What matters is what's the temperature at the point of lubrication. And my whole point is a zero is providing you one of the better films compared to a five compared to a 10, regardless of what that second number is, right? I could have given this entire presentation, talked about 40 weights or 20 weights, it doesn't matter. Point is those three lines are gonna look like those three lines. So. To wrap this up uh, kind of you know, on a high note here, and this is where the non-scientific part really comes in. Um, I was given a presentation like this over 20 years ago and I was convinced, I thought, I gotta try this. But you do the math on this, you go, is it gonna work? Does it make sense? So the math says, what if it's a 2% change? Well, if it's a 2% change and you can follow the numbers in the graphic or in the table there, but a 2% change, assuming that you know, you're gonna switch from a cheap 530 to a cheap 030, you're probably gonna end up paying a little bit more for the oil, but fuel is fuel. So the fuel cost is the same. And I just took the average price of fuel um, as of a week ago. And you look at um, average mileage in a vehicle and compare that to a 2% increase on the average mile, mileage of a vehicle, extrapolate all that data for 100,000 miles for a full warranty period of a vehicle. And you're gonna work out, it's about $160 savings if you get 2% increase changing your oil roughly every 3,000 miles. Just to show you some different math, here it is, if you change it every 5,000 miles, the number gets a little bit better. And if you change your oil every 10,000 miles, the number gets a little bit better yet, because um, you're spending less on oil. But I had to try this for myself. So this is the non-scientific, non-peer-reviewed part of it. So full disclosure, I drive Hondas. Now, one thing I'll say about Hondas, not as an endorsement, but just as fact, that if you look at all the other vehicles on the road, Hondas are the most fuel efficient. So basically, I'm just trying to you know, state without you know, <laughs> being you know, coy about this, I'm starting at the high end already. I'm starting with a vehicle that's known for fuel efficiency, and I tried to see, could I improve my fuel efficiency by switching my oil? So I did. The first vehicle I ever switched over was a 99 Honda that I bought from new, and I did about the first, I'd say 10 oil changes, on full synthetic 530. 
And what I did then was I had all my gas receipts for that time period, it was about three years or so, and uh, just added them all up, divided by the mileage, and worked out what was my average fuel economy throughout those first approximately 36,000 miles. Then I did it over the next uh, bunch of years until finally the vehicle was written off in an accident, but it had about 95,000 more miles on it at that time. Added up all those receipts divided by the mileage and gave you that number. And that was using a 030. And the funny thing was, it was actually a semi-synthetic 030. So anyone curious about, well, you know, you switched oils, did you get a better oil? Did you get a, you know, go from mineral to synthetic? I actually went from full synthetic to semi-synthetic. So if there was any argument along those lines, I'm telling you, I went to actually a lower quality oil um, and I did see about a 10% fuel economy increase. And the other full disclosure is I don't drive for mileage. I, I got a heavy foot. I, I speed quite regularly uh, when I'm on the highway. I don't typically in the city, but this vehicle was driven all over. I'm accounting for all seasonal variances and, 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 at least it's not very scientific, but bear with me, roughly a 10% increase. So I figured out then what would it have looked like had I made the switch from new and driven 100,000 miles using the zero rather than the five. And this is what the numbers would work out to be. So it works out to be little more than a thousand dollar savings. Now that suddenly seems like math that's worth doing, right? When I showed you that it was like, you know, 150 to $200 worth of savings over the course of say seven years of driving, no one's going to jump to that kind of, you know, opportunity and say, look, I'm saving money. They're like, I wouldn't even notice it. But if I could promise you something around a thousand dollars worth of savings or more, well, you start to be a little bit more interested. So I was convinced when I did this vehicle, I was convinced it worked. I thought this is great. So a few years later, my wife and I get pregnant. We decide we need a second vehicle. So we buy ourselves, guess what? Another Honda, identical vehicle, just seven years newer. And this one had a slightly different engine to it. And what we found was that um, we tried, because it already came with 520, we tried running different fuel. And we tried running premium compared to uh, just the standard grade. And this vehicle actually got better mileage running premium than it did running uh, regular grade. But when you do the math on that, and again, extrapolated over 100,000 miles, full warranty period, it actually cost us a couple hundred bucks. But the benefit was, and this was my logic why we did it, is I had to stop less often for gas. And that was, that was worth it to me. So this one wasn't a savings switching the fuel. But after we had it for a couple of years, I said, well, you know, we've basically gotten all the free maintenance we're going to get out of the dealership. Now I'm responsible for the oil changes. So guess what I threw in there? I threw in a zero. So here's the data. Now I'm, I'm admitting to you the fuel changed and the oil. So I went to a higher grade fuel, but I also went from a five to a zero. And the overall effect was about a 25% increase on the fuel economy of that vehicle. And that's the vehicle I still drive today. And it's got about 266 or 267,000 on it right now. And that vehicle used to get from factory just over 25, 25 miles per gallon. That's what it was rated at. Um, and it now averages over 30. And so like I said, I'm convinced. And I was convinced when I heard the presentation. I hope you're convinced from this presentation. But I know one, one question a lot of people ask me is go, does this presentation even work? Well, uh, funnily enough, about 14 years ago or so, I trained a group of power plant employees in a small town. And they got you know a whiff of the same presentation. And uh, I'll, I'll share that data with you. But another colleague of mine, he saw this and he said, I gotta try it for myself. So everything I've shown you was like I said, extrapolating as if I made the change from new. And I didn't, but I'm just trying to do the math to say, well, what if I had, what would that have looked like? So the colleague of mine who saw it, he tried it for himself. He drove Toyotas, which are also known for very, pretty good fuel efficiency. He got absolutely 0% change. He ran the same brand of 530 I was running. He switched to the same brand of 030 I was running. He did them both for one year, kept all his gas receipts, and he said, negligible difference, nothing really. So I can't promise that it'll happen, but I do know one effect that does happen. So this group of power plant employees that I trained, they were you know nearly 30 of them. They all took this in. Obviously, I made a connection with them because a little while later, uh, you know, I get my feedback forms back and everyone says, oh yeah, the course was great. Learned a lot. Love that part about engine oils. But a few months after that, 
I ran into the guy who organized the course and he started off with a, the phone call. And he said, you got, you really did a number on my guys. And I was like, oh my goodness, what did I do? I screwed up. But then if you read the rest of what he had to say, he's like, yeah, he says, they told me about all about the zero. And he said, I went to the store to buy it. And the guy at the store said they had a real run on it lately and he couldn't keep it in stock. So um, I knew the store owner um, in the small town. Funnily enough, I, I, I knew somebody who worked in the marketing department there and I said, look, I know this is a big ask, but could you look up the volumes that they've been selling at this store over the past year and provide it to me? You know, I know I'm asking for, you know, sort of inside information, but I said, I just want to see if there really was a spike in the sales at this, uh, at this store of zero product compared to uh, previous. And so here's the data. And you can see, like I said, I was there in September, roughly near the end of September. And you can see the massive spike, the, the sort of magenta, whatever you want to call it, maroon colored lines are um, the big jugs, the five quart jugs, and the, the lighter color is uh, the small one quart jugs. But yeah, there was a huge spike in the ensuing months as people swapped over to zero, not just because it was winter and you got better cold temperature, but they're all looking for that fuel economy improvement. So kind of my last comments here as well. Okay, maybe my presentation worked on one group. I haven't presented to all of industry, but industry's picked up on this anyways. Industry is shifting away from 1030s to 530s, away from 530s to 030s, They've even switched away from 530s to 520s. Industry is going thinner, thinner, thinner. So it appears, and where that's driven from, just to wrap us up here on the last couple of slides, has to do with something called CAFE ratings, which is corporate average fuel economy. And it is a stipulation that any vehicle sold in North America hit these targets as a fleet-wide average per company selling vehicles. And so it was instituted in the 70s after the second energy crisis. Targets were set. I'm showing you the uh, 2021 model year targets here. And basically, if you can't hit the targets, there's a non-compliance penalty. And long story short, is the first two companies that really got into this in a big way were uh, Ford and Honda. And they started switching away from the 530s to the 520s and seeing that this so-called thinner oil um, it had better fuel economy. But like I said, if you understand viscosity index, you'll realize that yes, being a lower grade is definitely a thinner oil, but not necessarily at all temperatures. And what you end up with is a higher VI product. And therefore it may be thinner when it's cold, but actually remains thicker when it's hot. And since this time, after about another 15 years, um, in about 2014, 2015 model year, you see a lot of more vehicles switched over from 520 to 020. So for the past about five model years of worth of years, we've seen more and more of industry switching to zeros. And again, it, it's the big driver here is all about fuel efficiency. So. There I am at my, my hour. Um, thank everyone who stayed to the bitter end here. Um, I'll uh, pause now and let Rob uh, let me know if there's any questions. But if you don't have time to stick around and ask questions, I, I threw my email here so you've got it in case you want to send me something. But I hope you got something out of it. I hope maybe you at least rethink what oils am I using and might consider a zero. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Evan. And uh, yeah, you covered a lot of ground there. and. I a lot of interesting things. I think yeah, you made the point about viscosity very well, and the details. And uh, you know, a lot of there's. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in how it changes temperature and pressure and uh, shearing. I didn't know about the um, silly putty and the. Sh I knew you could take silly putty and stretch it really fast and break, but I'm yeah. gonna have to try the shattering. Yeah, and, and again, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same shear effect, right? You pull slowly. It's like chewing gum. Yeah, you know, just stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch. But if you get that shear energy up higher, it's like a solid. So it fractures, it snaps. You you basically exceed the tensile strength of, of silly putty. So it changes depending on shear energy. Are there any other questions uh, from those who hung on till uh, the end here? Just uh, a positive, some positive comments. Good. If you can see those. Um, Switch over here so I can see. Yes, it is excellent presentation. Very practical and useful. Nice presentation. Um, well, and like you said, the, you know, a lot of us have maybe it's preconceived notions or a basic understanding of viscosity, but we don't always apply everything we learn to, you know, all, all of the things. And that's one of the things that this this part of my, my big course, I always find people just, you know, they come up to me at breaks or, or when we're done this and they're like, my mind's blown. I never, I never thought of it that way. I always thought that zero W was just thinner 
and therefore it was too thin to run in the summertime. I'm like, no, if anything, it's the best oil to run year round because let's face it, your ring cylinder interface and, and whatnot are at higher temperatures than the ambient conditions always. And I said, it's the oil that maintains that film as best as possible. So, but uh, one so, of the so there I is it all frequently is if zero is so darn good, why don't we use it everywhere? And the short answer to that one is shearing. That in, in a lot of applications, we'd simply shear that additive. And instead of running a 030, you'd be running a 020 or 010 or 05 or a straight zero, which would be you know many grades too thin and, and would not run in the long run. But in a passenger vehicle, which is lighter duty, we can get away with running zeros uh, quite nicely for the you know typical oil drain intervals that we expect without any issue. But yeah, we wouldn't use zeros and say heavy duty off-road, big industry, those kinds of things. There is a question here. I don't know if you can answer this, but it says, uh, curious to know if the difference between Honda and Toyota are related to the RPM they operate in, in, in normal driving conditions. Well, yeah, there's going to be a number of variables because, um, I mean, fuel efficiency is not just about friction, right? Fuel efficiency is all about combustion characteristics. So one thing that sets Honda apart from Toyota is they've got variable timing on their valves. It's something that uh, Honda's promoted for years. And then there's compression ratios as well. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And yeah, no, I couldn't, I could not speak. I don't know Toyota's versus Honda's uh, well enough to even come close to guessing all the differences as to where they, where they sit. Um, you know, it's like some of the things that Subaru I know has had to change have actually decreased their fuel efficiency over the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, engine design is constantly evolving and, uh, you know, they'll overcome their, their limitations and suddenly somebody else will just leapfrog and you'll see better fuel efficiency somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, there's just, there's a lot more to it than speed, temperature, you know, loads, surface areas. There's, there's other considerations too. Someone just had a comment. Heavy duty tries to reduce RPM to improve efficiency. Um, another thought. So you, you did mention at the, at the end the you know, different uh, producers of oil, different uh, brands. You know how is the uh, because yeah, the the W is more for the cold temperatures. So is that trend hold for like all different? brands of oil and different qualities of oil, or is it? Well, and that's the interesting thing, right? Because I work at a lab, a lot of people would presume that I might know who makes the best oil. And I always say, look, um, you know, SAE and API set these specifications. And so for viscosity, for the specification to be a whatever grade it is, so 0, 20 as an example. So you've got a five degree window between calling it a zero versus calling it a five, 20. And I said, that window is so tight that pretty much everyone's zero is within that same little tight range. There's not a lot of difference. And a 20 is a 20 or a 30 is a 30, whichever way it goes. So I said, from a viscosity perspective, it's, it's pretty hard for there to be much difference between one brand of engine oil versus another brand of engine oil if they're graded exactly the same viscosity grade. And then when you couple that with all the API specs, for the service classification, all the testing for anti-wear and for deposits and, 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 again, it really, it narrows that window down. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm not gonna say there's no difference, but I'm not gonna say there's a huge obvious difference. But essentially the point of my presentation is, yeah, I don't care what brand you buy, buy it from whatever brand you've already been buying, but rather than whatever the first number is, a five or a 10, ask for it in a zero keep the second number the way it is because that's what's specified by your OEM and that will affect warranty if it's still new enough to have warranty. But the first number you can change and the lower it is, the better your VI and the better your VI, the better overall performance you get. And long story short is it won't cause any worse effect, it won't increase your fuel economy. Like I said, one of my colleagues got no change, but it has the potential to increase fuel economy. And if you're paying the same price for the oil either way, why not? Why not try? That's All right. Um, I don't know how much time you have, but there's a few more questions here. Oh, I got plenty of time. I just don't want to keep right. anyone else if they. Uh, are you suggesting drive. that the only way to achieve better fuel economy is to use zero W? Isn't it possible to have an API resource uh, conserving 5W30 that is more efficient than an API 5W30 that doesn't have the RC designation? Wouldn't that then be related to the formulation, not just the VI grade? I think you kind of touched on that, but 
a little bit, but to the to, to that point, um, I can share one more slide here. So uh, I didn't throw this in the presentation, but when it comes to API certifications and um, fuel efficiency, the way API defines if an oil is fuel efficient or not fuel efficient, uh, when it says in the bottom half of the donut resource conserving is all about um, a, a reference oil. So here, here we go, there's the statistics. So um, they have their own reference fluid and you have to run the engine on the reference oil and measure its fuel economy. And then you swap out to the, this, this new oil that you have and it, you know same grade. And there's ways to achieve uh, better fuel efficiency within the same grade. And you could use, you know, some people talk about friction modifiers or, and whatnot, but VI improvers also play a, a bit of a role because you can have a, a slightly higher VI 530 compared to somebody else's 530 and that'll get you a little bit of what I'm talking about here. Um, so no, I'm not suggesting the only way to get the improved fuel economy is to switch to a zero. I'm just saying, basically my approach was, you're already using some oil. So call it 530, 520, whatever it happens to be. I'm saying you can maintain your warranty by making that first number a zero. You've changed nothing else about the system. You didn't have to go research your own additive chemistry, nothing. You just literally went to the store, bought a product that's been on the shelf since 1977, you know, it's been around for 44 years, zero W engine oils, and still people don't accept them very well because they, the marketing has been that they're cold temperature oils, that it only matters if it's somewhere where it gets very, very cold ambient conditions. And my point is, if you, if you think about everything you know about viscosity, they're actually better oils year round, regardless of ambient conditions. Um, and it's just an easy way to achieve better fuel economy, but no, there's certainly other ways. And this this designation that API gives in the donut is for some of those other ways because in this case you can't change the viscosity grade. This is a direct comparison. So if you want a higher fuel efficient 530, this is compared to a reference 530 from API and says, and you can see the numbers here, right? It's about three four percent better as a minimum that it has to achieve to get that designation. And they do it through other mechanisms than than yeah switching to a zero. All right. So some more questions here. Uh, Thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, how do used oils compare uh, zero grades versus fives and tens in terms of permanent shear and wear metals? In terms of wear metals, the, what I've seen, which I won't say is you know absolutely empirical, everyone's gonna see this, is actually decreased wear metals uh, because you get better flow at cold start, which is where you know we always say most of the wear happens anyways. Um, so wear metals go down. As for shearing, um, and I'll just qualify this, under a light duty application, so any passenger vehicle size, the amount of shear that I've seen um, over normal drain intervals, again, there's my other qualifying statement, normal drain intervals, not extended drain intervals where people are going beyond what's recommended. Um, no, it does not shear out of grade at all. It stays within its grade the whole time. Um, I wouldn't say that it necessarily even shears more than um, a five, but the potential is always there because Let's face it, if you're comparing a 020, as an example, to a 520, they're both 20s, the big difference between the two isn't just the base oil, but it's the amount of VI improver, because a zero will require more VI improver to get to a 20 than the five would. So because you simply have more of it, then you are exposing yourself to more uh, potential for shearing. So it will happen, but like I said, I've not seen that it shears out of grade. The only times I see oil shearing out of grade is when they go beyond passenger vehicles to heavy duty applications. And especially when it's an extended drain interval, when you know normal would be say 500 hours, maybe 250 hours and people try and run it to up to a thousand hours. Yeah, that kind of long run time, it will eventually shear it and pull it out of its original grade into the next lower grade. Um, that happens almost guaranteed. Um, so people either have to you know, suck it up and take it or shorten their drain intervals back to a shorter drain interval to avoid this in a heavy duty application. But short answer to the question was, no, I've not seen it in standard application, standard drain intervals. All right, so this, are you ready for a question about ethanol? This is kind of off topic, Ooh. but uh, yeah. in your studies, have you included the effect on performance with fuels with ethanol and without ethanol? Does this have any effect to consider, for example, outboard engines or boats uh, recommend not using ethanol? Yes, there's there's definitely, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say I've done the research. I've definitely read on the research. I've seen this. 
um, that yes, using ethanol blended fuels, uh, particularly in some engine designs, uh, you actually worsen your fuel economy. Um, you know, but again, it's it's all about engine design at that point, and I'm I'm not the engine design expert, barely the lube expert on this one. Um, so you know, it is it is definitely a consideration that there are some engines that run better uh, with ethanol blended fuels, some that run worse. Just like there are engines that are designed to run on higher octane than others, you know, and that have you know that's driven by things like compression ratio and whatnot as well. So yeah, there's no universal answer. Um, I can definitively tell you that my um, my 2006 Honda doesn't care, and my 99, it's about a 15% hit on fuel efficiency. I take a 15% reduction in fuel efficiency if I use ethanol blended fuels in that engine, because um, I've I, you know it was something I tried because I'm, I'm you know you're always curious right you're like once it's off warranty I'm like I can do whatever I want now and you know. Let's let's see what a few tanks of this gas do compared to that. You know, tanks of some other gas, and keep the receipts and measure it all out. And I was a little bit surprised on that one myself because I'd heard it from there's people I know in the racing community who do like, uh, you know, uh, track racing uh, things like that, and they they all swear away from ethanol. They don't want the ethanol blended fuel uh, for some of them, and the ones that do like in like a, more of the oval track, they love the ethanol blended fuel, and you're like. It's trying to understand why, trying to understand the differences. And like I said, the engine design plays a huge role in whether or not that makes makes or breaks the performance that you could could benefit from. But no, I don't have the research myself. I barely dabbled in it out of curiosity. All right. I think this is the last question here. Uh, I suppose some of the efficiency improvements is also a contribution of the boundary friction reduction using uh, friction modifiers besides the VI improvers. Can you discuss what are the improvements possible using friction modifiers? Well, friction modifiers, uh, I would say the common common misconception, uh, I, can, I can actually show you a slide on that one. Common misconception about friction modifiers is how they reduce the friction. Uh, a lot of people presume in some way, shape, form that they change the, the lambda value, change the fluid film thickness. And that's not really what happens. Uh, the, better way I can explain it is like this. How a friction modifier works is uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't change that film thickness, it doesn't bring you from boundary to mixed or from mixed to hydrodynamic. What it does is it creates a more easily shearable layer that is already there. So when we talk about you know, modifying the friction, the, the lambda value, the film thickness is, is relatively unchanged. But what happens is the amount of internal friction, the fluid friction, if you will, that exists there, it has been reduced. So yes, that can improve fuel efficiency. And that is how a lot of people uh, will do it within the same grade, as I was showing in that previous slide about how API defines a fuel efficient uh, uh, oil is by checking uh, it against that reference. People add friction modifiers to help with that. So they use like Molly, typically Molly based additives, some, some oils, you might see graphite, but in engine oils, we typically use molly-based ones. Um, and that's this, this graphic that you see now, this is how it's doing it. So it's not changing it, like I said, from boundary to mixed or otherwise. It's just reducing that amount of internal friction that that fluid has against itself um, during that type of contact. So that's how you get the fuel efficiency increase from friction modifiers. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think uh, every watching probably learned something. And um, I'll uh, send you that T-shirt we discussed for the Travelogy Miner. And awesome. Um, any other comments or anything you want to? Oh. I'm all. I'm all good. I <laughs> thank you for having me. All it's right. Yeah. Thank you for doing here. this. And uh, I guess everybody who's still here uh, will. Uh, have the next uh, seminar in about a month and uh, I'll send out more information about that as well. Um, thank you, everybody.